Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Marcel. Uh, so I'm Xiao. I'm from uh, University of Maryland. So today I'm going to talk about uh, authenticated garbling for efficient, malicious, secure two-party computation and how to extend this paper to global-scale multi-party computation. Uh, this is a joint work with uh, uh, Sam, uh, Samuel Ranalucci and uh, John, my advisor, Jonathan Katz. Uh, so let's start with some introduction. So secure multi-party computation is essentially some protocol that runs among a set of parties where they communicate to each other and is able to compute a function out of, them, out of their input. So the definition of so the security of MPC ensures that it's the same as all the parties send their input to a trusted agency and that the trusted agency is to compute the function inside and send the output to other parties. Uh, so the security guarantee is that um, nobody is going to know the other party's input except what they can learn from the output. Uh, so let's see um, uh, what, how MPC can be used in uh, some current uh, systems. So one status quo, uh, and, and this is very common, is a, a researcher who wants to study some diseases uh, from a set of patients. And in particular, they want to understand the correlation between the disease and their genomic data. So currently, this is done by all the patients and their data to the researcher. And the researcher is going to perform the genomic analysis locally uh, and find out whatever research results they, they can find. So in this kind of a scenario, the honesty of the researcher is really guaranteed or uh, ensured by ethics or law that they need to follow or some contract. So in case when we have MPC, so we can essentially change the picture. So in this case, all the parties, instead of sending the data to the researcher, they can run an MPC protocol where they send the genomic data to the MPC. And the MPC can output the results to the researchers. Uh, so in this case, the researchers never see any genomic data, but can still get the analysis result. And the honesty of researcher is ensured by MPC or cryptography in this case. Uh, so let's uh, take a look at another status quo. It just happened uh, this year. So we have uh, these big companies like Yahoo and Equifax. And uh, so everybody now knows that they actually hold a lot of data. And in this case, it actually can be 3 billion user account or about more than 100 million of uh, secure social security account. So by the way, I was surprised that uh, 3 billion is almost uh, half of world population. So uh, the way they, uh, they, they secure the data is that they are going to find a very powerful server and store the data on the server. And in order to prevent hackers from hacking into the server, they will find all the ways that they can, they can find to secure this server, such that even if there is a hacker, the hacker is not able to hack into the machine. So this seems fine, but also it uh, leads to a single point of failure. So in the sense that uh, if there is some system vulnerability or careless, careless maintenance, or if they just forget to patch the system, uh, system bugs, the, act, uh, the hacker is very easy to get in, as we see in many cases. Uh, so when we have MPC, we can also uh, improve on top of this kind of status quo. So instead, uh, the, the, uh, the company can actually secret share their data to multiple servers, such that even if they uh, hack it into one or a subset of the servers, the data is still hidden. So now, you know, if we want to compute any fun and uh, uh, again, all the servers can be protected by different uh, mechanisms or companies or whatever. So in this case, the servers are installed on different operating systems. So if a hacker wants to hack into all of them, they need to find uh, vulnerabilities in each operating system, which are developed independently. So when they want to uh, access the data or do any computation, they can just run MPC, and the MPC will run the analysis or queries for the, uh, for the company. So now, if we, if we have a hacker that finds a system vulnerability in one of the, uh, for example, Windows machine, then he's still not able to get anything out of it because uh, that share looks random to him, to her. Uh, so now, I uh, uh, hope everybody is convinced that MPC is, uh, is sort of useful. Uh, so let's start with uh, the classifications of MPC protocols. Uh, so one of the most important factor here is the, the number of parties that is involved in the MPC protocol, 
and we have uh, a lot of work working on uh, from, from multi, uh, for two-party setting, and we have uh, another, another line of work for multi-party. And uh, uh, we also classify the protocols depends on uh, adversarial behavior. So uh, we can either assume it is malicious, which means that the adversaries uh, can be behave arbitrarily or semi-honest, in, in, in which case adversary can behave, uh, only uh, is assumed to follow the protocol. Uh, we also have other uh, kinds of models, uh, for example, covert. And uh, we also uh, uh, talk about number of corrupted, corrupted parties. Uh, for example, we, have, we can we assume like honest majority and dishonest majority. And in dishonest majority, uh, one, one the strongest definition is that uh, it, it, it assumes that all but uh, myself is corrupted, which, which is uh, all but the one corruption. And finally, uh, we classify MPC protocols depends on the computation model. That is how this F is represented. We can either represent the protocol or the function as Boolean circuits or arithmetic circuits or even in like RAM programs. So in, in this talk, we are going to fo focus on malicious security, all but one corruption, and Boolean circuits. And uh, I will start with uh, uh, our improvement on two-party, which is going to be the first part of the talk. And, I will, and then I will proceed with multi-party, which is the second part of the talk. So in Chinese philosophy, uh, one very, very important feature is how to balance conflicting elements. So it turns out that uh, this kind of balancing between conflicting elements is also true in the MPC community. So for example, in the very early age, we have a uh, YOS Garbo circuit protocol, uh, which is a consonant run and uh, uh, is very efficient. But the communication is a little, little bit higher. On the other hand, we have secret sharing based protocol, which is linear round, because uh, the number of rounds depends on the, uh, on the circuit. Uh, so essentially, the kinds of stands on the yin and the yang of this figure. Uh, so before we get into the detail of the, our protocol, we want uh, to give a high level introduction on this yin and yang protocol, a uh, yin and yang picture. Uh, so I will start with a uh, garbage circuit. Uh, so the basic idea, uh, here I'm going to use the AND gate as an example to introduce the basic idea how to garble a gate. So, let's, uh, so in order to garble a gate, we, are, we associate random garble labels on the input wire and output wires. And, uh, and, and, and uh, according to the logic, here is the AND, we can write out the truth table of it. And then, uh, so the garble table is essentially uh, some kinds of encryption of the output label using input labels as the key. So here I uh, just use a random oracle uh, to model it to make it uh, uh, easier. And uh, in order, uh, so for a garbo gate, uh, of course we don't send the truth table because that will reveal uh, what, what the gate is arranged. And also we need to randomly permute it in order to uh, hide the information. So when, uh, so when this kind of garbo gate is used in a protocol, so the, we, we assume on the left-hand side, Alice has input X, and on the right-hand side, Bob has input Y. So they will first run a protocol called oblivious transfer. Uh, in case you don't know, uh, you, you are not sure what it is. It allows Alice to send two uh, objects, and allows y, uh, Bob to send one bit, indicating which one he wants to choose. And uh, the, the ideal functionality is going to send one of them uh, to Bob, which is the one that Bob chose without Alice, letting Alice know the choice. And then Alice can send the labels corresponding to Alice's own input and the garbo table, which is permuted to Bob. And then, given all this information, Bob can actually evaluate this garbo table locally and get the, get the garbo label corresponding to the output label. So when we have a multiple gate, in this case, uh, it's still very, it's very easy to extend the previous protocol because we will associate different garbo table to different gate, and Alice just need to, in, instead of just sending one table, he will send uh, multiple tables to Bob. Uh, so this, kind, this protocol is actually constant round independent of the uh, topology of the circuit. However, uh, it is a semi-honest, uh, it's only secure in a, a semi-honest uh, setting. Okay, go back to the picture. 
Um, so in order to in, uh, strengthen this protocol to malicious security, there are majorly uh, two lines of work based on garbage circuit. So one is circuit level cut and choose, and another is uh, gate level cut and choose. Uh, so in the circuit level cut and choose, uh, Alice, instead of just sending one garbage circuit, is going to send multiple copies of garbage circuit. And Bob will uh, randomly pick uh, half, roughly half of them and tell Alice uh, the, the random set. Uh, Alice uh, will open those, those circuits that is picked by Bob. And then Bob will locally check the correctness of this randomly chosen subset of circuit. So if all of them are correct, then Bob gets some confidence on the, on the rest that are not opened. Uh, we can do some calculation to find out the exact probability. And then there are like uh, many works that are based on this uh, semi-trusted garbage circuit, and we can design various kind of protocol to, to have a fully malicious two-party computation. So in the state of the art, uh, uh, works, uh, we need, if we want to achieve statistical security parameter of rho, which means that uh, adversary succeed in cheating with more probability uh, at most uh, two to the power minus rho, we need rho circuit. So as we can see, if we want to achieve a very high security parameter, statistical security parameter, then we actually need a large number of garbage circuits. And also, uh, we also need to handle the consistent, different kinds of consistency because multiple Scarborough circuits are involved. Uh, so the other, uh, the other line of work is, uh, uh, is gate level cut and choose. So instead of sending multiple copies of garbage circuit, uh, we are going to send multiple copies of garbage gate. And again, Bob will choose uh, randomly uh, roughly half of them to check and Alice is going to open them, and Bob will check them locally. So up to now, it's very similar to circuit level cut and choose. And, uh, uh, so let's just, and then they can kind of randomly bucket them into small bucket and connect them into a circuit. So for example, if our circuit has three gate, uh, so uh, they, pour, they can do this kind of uh, random arrangement. And, uh, and then they can do uh, for, the, for the protocol on top of this. So it turns out, turns out that this soldering is actually very expensive, uh, reasonably expensive. And uh, so the state of, for the state of the art work, the performance is roughly about the same as uh, circuit level cut and choose. So now we are done with uh, uh, some introduction on the garbage circuit part. So we will proceed with the secret sharing based protocols. Uh, so in a secret sharing based protocols, uh, let's assume again Alice has input X and Bob has input Y. The first step is that they are going to secret share their inputs such that uh, uh, X, X1, X or X2 is X and uh, Y1, X or Y2 is Y. So every time in, they encounter a gate, they will call a gate uh, a functionality that helps them compute the gate. So the, this functionality uh, roughly follows three steps. The first step, the functionality inside will reconstruct X and Y uh, in some way. And then they will compute uh, the output of the, uh, of the output, uh, the output of the gate. And then the functionality will, re will pick a random two bit, two random bits, uh, such that they are, they are secret share of the output and send the shares to the two party. So know that here, all, everything is done inside of the functionality, so the two party don't really know what's going, uh, what's the value inside of the functionality. And uh, when they have the next gate, they can just run this again and again until they get the result. So here, uh, because we have this kind of dependency of the input and output, so the number of runs uh, is, has to be linear to the steps of the circuit. And, uh, and also this protocol is semi-honestly secure because the parties can just send run bit into this ideal functionality. So there are also uh, a lot of work to try to strengthen this kind of protocol to, uh, with malicious security. Uh, so I, here I pick some, some examples. So the first the class is the tiny OT family that I will be in, I will be talk about in more detail. And we we can also use generic GMW compiler or IPS compiler to get more asymptotically efficient solution. Uh, so. To talk about uh, TinyOT protocol, I will start with uh, bit authentication. That is, how to authenticate a bit. 
So in this case, uh, let's assume that Alice has a bit X that, that she wants to authenticate, and Bob has a authentication key, delta B, uh, which is kept private. Uh, so uh, in order to authenticate a bit, they essentially have some uh, uh, functionality that output a MAC and a key to the two party. So the guarantee is that uh, the, MAC, the XR of the MAC and the key will equal to zero if the bit is zero, and will equal to this private delta uh, if, the, if the bit is one. Uh, so I will use uh, this kind of solid box for max, for Mac and uh, uh, this empty box for key uh, from now on. And the color will denote the ownership of the key. Uh, so uh, this kind of bit authentication is very useful because let's say if we have another bit uh, with the same similar uh, equation, we can actually locally compute the, the, the MAC on the XR of the two bit. That, that is, if, we, if the XR, the, the MAC and key is locally, uh, it turns out that the result is also an authentication on the XR of them. Now let's uh, start uh, talk about uh, authenticating a secret share, which is something more complex than a bit. So suppose two parties want to secretly share bit X where one party uh, has x1 and one party has x2. In this case, we will run the protocol symmetrically, so the two parties each has authentication key. Uh, and, and they will have max and keys symmetrically. Uh, so x1 is the max uh, uh, for, the, for the bit x1, authenticating to Bob with key uh, empty box x1, and the lower part is symmetric to uh, help Bob authenticate, uh, to help them to authenticate the bot, a bit X2 owned by Bob. So in this case, because uh, each of them only knows one share, it's a secret share, and each of the share is also authenticated using this kind of authentication. And uh, uh, similar equations also hold, except that uh, the delta, the rule of the delta slips. So when we have this kind of uh, secret share authentication, we can actually run a maliciously secure secret sharing based protocol fairly easily by, by feeding this authenticated bit into the functionality. So the functionality will now become, uh, com uh, will, will compute an authenticated gate. And the first step is to check that the inputs are authenticated correctly. And from, them on, from the now on, it's essentially the sim very similar to semi-honest protocols. And the, the functionality also outputs authenticated bit, secret shared bit, such that this kind of equation holds. And again, the, uh, uh, we can, we, if we have multiple gates, we can just run this protocol again and again you know, until we get the output. Okay, so now we have a high level idea on the yin and the yang. So I will, uh, I will start with, uh, I will now talk about uh, some intuition of our protocol in the two party setting. So this is our picture here. We have constant run protocol and the linear run protocol. Uh, so one feature is that the constant run protocols has very low latency because it's constant run, but it has also has a very low throughput because of the high communication. On the other hand, secret share based protocol has a high latency, uh, has a high throughput because uh, it, uh, many of these protocols has very small communication, but the latency is much higher because of the round trip. So we can see these are kind of very two different frameworks. So our protocol essentially combines these two kind of uh, uh, frameworks into our protocol. And the, uh, in detail, we use a maliciously secure secret sharing based protocol. And, we, and uh, on top of that, we add a semi-honest garbled circuit and get a maliciously secure protocol that is also constant run. So our communication is only marginally higher than malicious secret sharing protocol, uh, with, uh, with the overhead is only a semi-honest garbage circuit. Therefore, we, achieve, we can achieve low latency and high throughput at the same time. So uh, uh, I will give uh, uh, intuitions of our protocol, and, is, and particularly the, the first part is about the selective failure attack. So in the ordinary semi-honest protocol, Alice sends the garbage circuit to Bob directly, and if Alice is malicious, Alice can corrupt one of the row in the garbage table. 
So this kind of corruption actually leads to, uh, helps Alice to learn some information. And let's see, let's see why it is the case. Because the one of the row, or a subset of the row is corrupted, Bob may not uh, succeed in evaluating the garbage circuit because some of them are not valid. So if Alice selectively corrupt one, some of the row, Alice can essentially observe whether Bob abort or not and know that which row, uh, which row Alice is uh, used to, eva uh, Bob is used to evaluate the cable, uh, table. And also, because the copper circuit is constructed by the Alice, Alice know how the rows are randomly permuted. But by combining these two information, Bob, uh, Alice can essentially learn some information about the input. So, in our, so our way to prevent uh, selective failure attack is that we will find some way such that the two parties, instead of uh, uh, let Alice uh, uh, garbling the circuit directly, they will, they will get a secret share of the garble table. So here I split them into vertically, but in our protocol they are secretly shared, not vertically shared. So Alice uh, will send the share, he, uh, her share to Bob, and now Bob uh, has the garble table as before and the Bob can evaluate the table as normal. So you, we may wonder that what exactly it helps, because if Alice corrupt a row, Alice can still easily corrupt it. But the interesting part is that uh, even if uh, Alice corrupt a row, Alice can only learn which row is being evaluated by, the Bob, by Bob. It does not help Bob to learn, uh, does not help Alice to learn information about the input, because input, uh, Alice does not know exactly how the table is permuted. So without this information, Alice cannot correlate the information about which row is evaluated and the information about the input. So we, we essentially break the chain in the last step. So now it seems that it's very important to figure out what's, uh, what's the way to compute this kind of secret shares of the garbage table. So uh, it's actually a little bit complex, but I will just uh, give some high level idea on how to compute a secret share of a, of a garbage label, a permuted garbage label. Assume that L0 and L1 uh, are pairs of garbage labels for a wire, and they are permuted by a secret bit lambda. In this case, uh, we will first adopt a free XR technique to write this as this formula. So here, delta is the free XR delta that we already seen in the last talk. So now the key step is that we are going to align the delta in free XR with the delta in the authentication key that, we mentioned, that I mentioned in the secret sharing based protocol. So uh, when, and then we will further uh, try to uh, uh, secret, secretly share lambda into lambda one, lambda two, and we would like uh, one, each party holding one of them. And uh, by doing some uh, simple uh, arithmetic, we are essentially adding the adding this empty box of lambda two as a, a key. And it turns out that uh, the permuted lambda can essentially uh, be written like this. So just give you a reminder that uh, the solid box is the Mac held by Bob. And this empty box is, is the key held by Alice. So given all this information, Alice actually can locally compute the first uh, part of, the, of, the, of this equation. And Bob already know the last part of the equation. So this, is, this essentially means that the two parties, given the uh, tiny OT authentication, they can, they can compute the, locally the shares of a permuted bit directly. So now that we get, get an idea how to prevent, prevent selective failure attack, let's talk more about how to ensure correctness. Because here, Alice can, uh, may still be able to uh, corrupt, uh, corrupt the garbage table to compute some other functionalities, for example, Alice can actually uh, append a not gate on the, on, on the output wire easily. So our first idea is that, okay, we probably can authenticate each row in some way such that Alice cannot really just randomly choose the, change the contents. But actually, uh, authenticating each row completely is an overkill because uh, we already uh, prevented a selective failure attack. It means that Alice cannot arbitrarily corrupt the row. Alice can only change the logic in some way. So therefore, in, in our final protocol, we actually only authentic, authenticate the permutation bit, uh, which, which is used to permute, permute the uh, garbage table. And it turns out that this is already enough. Uh, to put it everything together, 
uh, pictorically, uh, our, go our shares of the, our protocol looks like this. Uh, so here, uh, R and S are shared permutation bits. Uh, these two chunks are shared garbled table, uh, very similar to what, I, uh, what we just saw two, two slides ago. And this red part is the authentication on Alice's share of permutation bits. And it turns out that uh, all these uh, shares held by all, all the parties can just be computed using one tiny OT triple. So this means that we can essentially run tiny OT and then use this uh, single garbage table to make it constant run. Uh, so in summary, uh, so, uh, so, this, so, uh, so this part of the protocol is essentially a kind of a compiler that makes tiny OT to a constant run protocol using some very cheap garbling techniques. So, uh, so, we, uh, uh, so, but this is not, not the end of the story. We also tried, we also optimized tiny OT protocol to achieve a better uh, efficiency. So I will also give a high level idea of what we did. So in the first step, it's actually uh, very similar to recent works that works on uh, secret share B based protocol. So in the first step, we will compile, we will compute some, uh, some N triples that are authenticated. Uh, uh, so here, the, all, the, all these bits are, random, uh, are just random bits with no correlation. And then they can run a very cheap protocol that just takes like a very small number of bits to fix the correlation. So now this X and Z uh, should, uh, should have this end correlation. Except that uh, if a malicious party want to corrupt, uh, the malicious party can change the correctness. And the, so this part, the first step is, is, uh, is maliciously secure against pri for privacy, but only semi-honest is secure for correctness. Uh, oops. Uh, okay, yeah. So in the second step of our, of our protocol, we will prove the re we will prove in some way that the that the entry and relationship actually holds. So this step takes also a very small amount of communication. However, uh, this kind of check is not perfect. It allows the adversary to to conduct a selective failure attack to learn some information. So in detail, this kind of selective failure attack. Uh, works, uh, works like this. So the adversary can guess the value of x. So if x, if the adversary guessed correctly, uh, adversary can learn x without being detected. If adversary uh, guess is incorrect, then he will be detected and the protocol will abort and the adversary will be caught. And uh, since the, the, bit of the value of x is uh, random, the, uh, ally, uh, the adversary uh, succeed with one half probability each time uh, adversary want to uh, guess a bit. So we will call it a leaky triple. In the last step, uh, we will use the bucketing technique. So suppose that uh, we computed this kind of triple multiple times, where some of them are secure and some of them are leaky. We will do a random shuffle of all the triples and uh, bucket them uh, into, a, into a small bucket. The, the guarantee is that in each bucket, there will be at least one triple that is secure but uh, uh, that is secure uh, both, for, uh, both for correctness and for privacy. And then uh, uh, we can do a, we'll do a combined protocol that can extract the correct part out of, uh, correct and privacy part out of uh, each bucket. So I won't talk about the detail, but the output is secure as long as uh, one of the triple in the bucket is secure. So finally, this kind of, uh, this, after, after we are done with this step, uh, the output triples are private and secure against the malicious uh, adversaries. <clears throat> so we, impl we implement our protocol based on EMP toolkit. So we incorporate uh, the optimizations for authenticated bit, OT extension, and base OT by state-of-the-art uh, papers. And we use hardware acceleration whenever possible. So the, uh, uh, the machine we use is from Amazon with 36 car, with 32 cars and 10 gigabit lane. So all the evaluations uh, from, now on, from now on assumes 40-bit uh, security and 128-bit computational uh, security. And we will divide our protocol into four steps. The first step is base OT, which, uh, which, which just need to be executed once uh, for our life. And then we will have function-independent preprocessing where we only know the circuit size. And the function-dependent function preprocessing where we know the uh, circuit. And lastly, uh, the online phase where we also know the input. 
so here is a, uh, is a comparison in the single execution setting. So the blue bar is our paper, uh, is, is this work. Uh, oh, uh, this, is, this is the communication complexity. And we can see the, uh, uh, so here we only measure the communication from the maximum communication from one party to the other party. Because the two-way communication can be done in parallel, assuming that the network is duplex. And uh, so in the amortized setting, uh, we can also achieve a competitive uh, result compared to other papers that are designed for amortized uh, com secure computation. And we are actually, we are also having a, a ongoing work uh, also with Mike Roslick, where we can further improve the communication uh, by 40%. So in terms of the running time, uh, I selected a few representative works from the first work by Pinkas et al. And we can see we have a very, very good progress to improve the time for computing AES. And again, our ongoing work will improve the time a little bit to less than 10 milliseconds, not including the setup phase. <clears throat> so now I will do some detailed comparison for based on AES. So, uh, so the, on the left hand side is the single execution. We can see for the previous best protocol that supports function independent phase, we achieve eight times improvement for the function independent phase without, uh, without increasing other part of the, um, the time. And for the, part, for the protocol that is based on single execution uh, setting uh, only and, and uh, no independent preprocessing, we can also improve the, the, the performance by uh, more than two times. And in the amortized setting, uh, our time is roughly the same as the protocol that is based on, that is designed for amortized setting, but we can almost uh, pull all the computation to the function independent setting. And we can see actually computing AES is not exciting anymore because the circuit is too small. So we choose to evaluate on, and, 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 and use some larger circuit. So these are traditionally used benchmarks, and then we uh, use the three more circuit of different shapes. So the first one uh, has uh, circuit size linear to the input size, the second one is quadratic to the input size, and the last one uh, is polylog. So uh, as we can see, the largest circuit has tens of millions of gates and hundreds of thousands of input bits. And for this kind of large circuit, we, can, we, can, we still can finish the, uh, uh, the evaluation in less than in about 10 seconds. And so now I will uh, go to the global, global scale secure multi-party computation. So remind, uh, uh, let's just, let me just remind that our two-party protocol is like this. And then similarly, our multi-party protocol is essentially a, 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 an extension of the two-party protocol. Uh, it's, it's much, it's, uh, it's achieves a better, a better security in the sense that it to tolerates all but one security. So from a high level idea, uh, the two party protocol lo works like this. We have a gobbler and an evaluator, and we have this uh, authenticated gobbling um, uh, ideal functionality that outputs the shares of gobble table to the two party. And then uh, gobbler's, uh, gobbler's uh, shares of permutation bit is also authenticated to evaluator such that gobbler cannot cheat arbitrarily. So in the multi-party setting, for example, here we have three-party setting. So in, uh, instead, we will, we will uh, have the authenticated gobbling output three shares, um, three out of three shares of uh, the gobble table. And the, and the two gobblers permutation bit will all be authenticated to the evaluator. So in this case, uh, let's, let's see what if two, two parties collude. If gobbler and the evaluator collude, it's the picture actually looks exactly the same as what we had in the previous slide in the in in case of two-party setting. A more challenging, challenging case is when a gobbler and evaluator collude. However, because the permutation of the gobble table is shared as a, as a, in a three-way fashion, even if gobbler and evaluator cheat, they cannot know how the gobble table is permuted. Therefore, the selective failure attack that we presented in the two-party setting does not work because the adversary still does not get the permutation bit. Because, uh, and because of this kind of uh, three-way share, we need a, a three-party version of authenticated bit, 
three-party version of the authenticated shell and a three-party version of the tiny OT protocol. And uh, because of the time constraint, I will focus on three-party, uh, multi-party version of the authenticated bit and multi-party multi -party version of the authenticated shell. Uh, so this is the picture uh, for two-party authenticated bit. So when, when, uh, in order to extend this into the three-party setting, uh, we can just run it twice, essentially. It looks uh, simpler, quite, quite simple in the sense that essentially uh, Alice bit is authenticated to two parties using different keys. However, um, of course, it's, uh, it's actually not secure because uh, if Alice is malicious, Alice can use inconsistent, inconsistent value of x1 when Alice authenticates to different parties. So we actually need to do some extra check to ensure that Alice is using the same X when, when Alice is authenticating to different parties. And once we have a secure, and this kind of check is actually, uh, the cost is minimum. Uh, when we have this kind of authenticated bit, uh, we can use authenticated bit to construct authenticated share. And again, we will just run the authenticated bit multiple times. So, he, uh, so here, Alice authenticate uh, X1 to the two parties. Uh, so we, are, we will ask Bob to authenticate X2 to the two parties on this side. So we can notice that uh, the third party actually uh, hold two keys of the same color. So one is the authentication key for X1 to authenticate as Alice bit, and another one is to authenticate Bob's uh, bit X2. And we can run it again uh, uh, for, the last, uh, uh, for the last part. <clears throat> and when we have this kind of, uh, we run it three times, uh, uh, so from a high level idea, every party authenticates their bit to every other party. So we kind of have an squared number of different uh, 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 authentication and keys. And again, this is not secure because we run the same protocol multiple times independently without any consistency check. So we, again, we need to do uh, some check to ensure that uh, th this achieves what we actually want to achieve. So here, uh, so let me just go back a little bit. So uh, when, when the third party authenticates Alice, uh, he's, uh, he's using delta C. But when, uh, we are assuming that he is also using the same delta C when he authenticates Bob. But uh, so, so this is uh, not true for, adversary, for the adversary. So we need to do that uh, extra check to ensure that everybody always use the same global key. And this turns out that this check can also be done pretty efficiently, assuming that the authenticated bit is secure. Uh, so let's, uh, uh, let me just compare the complexity of a different paper and uh, our paper. Uh, so, in the, so, the, so the best paper that achieves uh, for concretely efficient protocols with a linear run is by Fredrickson et al. in 2015. And uh, uh, so Linda and Hao and Hase et al. proposed uh, um, uh, uh, more uh, constant run protocols uh, in Linda at all, they are based on BMR with speeds, using speeds to gobble the shared gobble circuit. And the Hase at all use the more advanced techniques. <clears throat> so as we can see, we, we are able to achieve a better complexity uh, without increasing the round. And by the way, actually the, paper, the, uh, the recent paper by Hase at all is, is also kind of inspired by our two-party two work in the first part of the talk. Uh, so in terms of the evaluation, uh, so, all, uh, so the all timings in the following will be based on AES evaluation. And all the machines are, again, the same as two-party settings. So we evaluate our protocol in two settings. One is in the LAN setting, where all the parties are con connected with the high-speed network. And another kind of setting, which is a global scale setting, where all the, all the machines are spread all over the world. So we choose all uh, regions that Amazon provided. Uh, that covers three continents. Uh, however, they don't actually have any machines in uh, Antarctica or Africa. So once they have the machine, we can run the real global scale computation. Uh, so let's uh, first take a look at the LAN setting with small number of parties, up to 14 parties. So we can see, so here, when, even when we have 14 parties, evaluating AES takes less than half a second. Uh, so remind that, uh, uh, just want to remind everybody here that 14 parties 
so 13 of them are assumed to be maliciously, to be controlled by a malicious adversary. So we can see actually, so a function independent phase takes almost uh, more than 16% of the time. And the cost of setup phase increases very slowly because we use multi-threading and to do all the base OT between different, pair, different pairs of parties at all at the same time. And then the online part is uh, tiny because the online part only, uh, only involves communication for input output and evaluating the circuit. Uh, so here, uh, so you don't, need, you don't need to count, this is 33 machines. So this is the largest uh, instance of MP, uh, MPC protocol that is run before our paper. So this is by uh, Ben Ephraim et al. last year CCS, and this is, uh, this is in semi-honest security. So we are actually able to run the uh, run uh, MPC protocol among 128 um, parties. And, and as far as we know, this is the largest MPC execution with the largest number of parties. Okay, uh, so let's take a look at uh, what's, uh, go what's going on when we have uh, a massive amount of parties. So here, the x-axis is the number of parties, and every time we double it by twice. And ju I just want to remind everybody how, what, how the picture looks like in, when we have up to 14 parties. We can see, actually, the figure, the decomposition of the figure changes a lot. So when we have very small number of parties, function independent phase, where we run a tiny OT protocol takes most of the time. But here, it, seem, uh, it seems that a function dependent phase actually takes much more time. I just want to remind everybody, in the function dependent phase, we are just sending the garbage circuit. We are not doing uh, tiny OT, which is, which, uh, which is assumed to be the heavy part. So actually, we get confused uh, uh, when, we, when we are writing the paper why this is the case, because it doesn't make sense to us at that time. But uh, when we, uh, and then we analyze the protocol a little bit further, we find that actually in the function independent phase, all the communication and computation are amortized among all, par all pairs of the parties. Oops. Uh, yeah, so, so the communication uh, is amortized uh, among like a quadratic number of uh, communication channels. But when in the, uh, in the dependent phase, n minus one garbleers will send their share of the garble circuit to one party. So the incoming bandwidth of the evaluator actually becomes the bottleneck of the protocol. So this single party becomes a bottleneck, while in the previous setting, uh, everything is amortized evenly, so the, the bottleneck is kind of uh, uh, evenly distributed. So we don't know uh, how to improve it yet, but, I, uh, but we think this is a very interesting question, and we should find a way to solve it, to improve the time much better. <coughs> um, so now I will give some uh, timings on global scale setting to evaluate the uh, AES. So when we run it on uh, East US, it takes about uh, less than 400 milliseconds to compute uh, AES. And when we run it uh, on all the machines in US, it takes about uh, less than three seconds. And when, when we run it over all the machines in US and uh, Europe, it takes uh, less than seven seconds. And finally, when we run it on all the, all the machines all over the world, we have five continents, it takes uh, uh, roughly uh, 20 seconds to compute AES. And as far as we know, again, this is the most, this is the most geographically distributed MPC execution uh, up to date. Uh, uh, so in this case, all, each, uh, in each region, we only have one machine. But don't worry, uh, because we are also uh, excited to run global scale massive uh, secure computation. So that's what's uh, the next slide. Uh, so we actually uh, find, picked uh, eight, uh, eight uh, widely distributed regions and put 16 machines in each of the regions. And uh, we run an MPC protocol of, uh, for AES among all of them and takes about 140 seconds to run uh, among these 128 parties. Again, I want to uh, uh, remind that uh, 127 of them are assumed to be malicious. Oh, it's actually very complicated. For example, between the, the run trip delay between US and Europe is about 75, uh, 575 milliseconds. But the run trip time between US and Australia is much, much higher. Uh, 
it's about uh, one or two million, one, one or two hundred milliseconds. Yes. Also, the bandwidth also varies. So, be, for example, if it is uh, within the US, U.S. East, you actually can get like a much higher bandwidth uh, compared to the uh, to if we, uh, if we run the port uh, between the link between U.S. and Europe. Yeah. Okay, it's very good that people are asking questions. Uh, <clears throat> so I want to uh, advertise, advertise a little bit what we will provide and we will have provide in EMP toolkit. So essentially, we want to provide a, a Chinese restaurant menu kind of uh, choices for everybody that, that who, who want to use MPC, of course. Uh, so so for, for a developer, you, you essentially just need to choose, uh, for example, whether you want two-party or multi-party and whether you want malicious or semi honest security and we would like to provide the different combinations of the protocol for different choices. So here, uh, the semi-honest two-party is a well-known uh, yaws gobble circuit with optimization by the Hu et al. And for semi-honest multi-party, we also have ongoing work with uh, similar ideas, but to optimize for semi-honest security. And for malicious multi-party, com maliciously secure multi-party competition is the global scale MPC protocol I just mentioned. And for two-party, we actually provide two options. Uh, uh, so uh, the two-party authenticated goblin that I, in, I introduced uh, in the first part is for better performance if the circuit is reasonably large, for example, uh, tens of millions of, uh, of, uh, of gates. But when we have billions of number of gates, uh, this, kind of, uh, this actually uh, re requires much larger memory cost because we need to do this bucketing, and all of them need to be stored in the memory all at the same time. So when we have uh, billions of uh, numbers of gates, uh, we, so we can, we can use our recent EuroCrypt paper that scales to much larger circuit. And the largest circuit we can run in that uh, protocol is 4.3 4 billion gates. And we, can, we, we didn't run much la larger circuit than that uh, because, uh, because, uh, well, because we think it's time to stop. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, so thank you, everybody. And uh, so please welcome to use our EMP and the PME if you have any questions. And again, the most important message, I'm on the job market. In, in the global scale setting, um, so you mentioned that there's a problem that there's the bottleneck in the communication. Yeah, yes. Because one party has to be kind of uh, special to, to, un, to combine the secret shares of the garbled circuit, right? Yes. So could you select that special node, and did you select that node to be no. special uh, among, because in the global setting, Certainly, some of them will have a best average latency with all the other nodes, or something like that. Uh, so, uh, so first, all the machines are of the same configuration, and I think the evaluation. I mean, uh, so the uh, so that evaluator is essentially located in uh, U.S. East Virginia region. I mean, it, uh, we didn't optimize that at all. It's uh, just a random choice. Yeah, I mean, but that that would be a very interesting direction to see. Like, what's the effect of to change the to change the location of the evaluator? Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> One of the things that you discussed here was the quadratic growth over time as we have the increased number of parties. What do you see as future research projects for getting to a subquadratic growth rate? Well, there's a uh, there's a uh, crypto paper like uh, ten years ago talking about uh, if we have a massive amount of parties where like a constant fraction of them are assumed to be adversary, then we can amortize, uh, we can achieve a much, much better uh, asymptotic efficiency. And, uh, using packet secret sharing and uh, some kind of BMR and stuff, uh, I think that will be a very interesting direction, but uh, uh, it's not clear how to make it concretely efficient yet. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I... <laughs> Oh, I'm looking for academic job. Um, postdoc also, yes. I mean, mainly academic job. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's it. Let's uh, thank 
tell 